Should we start it? about your talk was the way it was it was trying to address very closely um, <coughs> a state policy yeah. and um, it was trying to respond very specifically to you know what an anthropologist might bring to the evaluation of that policy as opposed to kind of what anthropologists sometimes offer which is a rather uh, vague critique that popular notions are inadequate but they don't really offer something else but um, how do you think that you might then you might, you might then make this uh, assessment, this interpretation you've made accessible to uh, the people who matter, as it were. I don't know. I think, I think like, in regards to the one-child policy, I mean, obviously, the, the purpose of the one-child policy is to reduce the population of China, but it's having, I mean, as I kind of mentioned, it's having so many very profound kind of rippling effects, um, which I think would have been difficult, perhaps, to predict at the time. Um, I think... I mean, it's, yeah, it's kind of difficult to know. I mean, I'm writing, the, the paper that I'm writing on this is about the construction of governmentality in China um, and how, how government policy has inadvertently changed the, um, the perceptions of female status um, within China. And I think it's, I mean, it, yeah, it's difficult, it's difficult, um, it's difficult to know, but it, it, I think it's interesting that that a government policy like this has been so effective in transforming the status of women compared to, for example, a lot of NGOs which are which are kind of working. And China is a is an interesting political si uh, situation because so few NGOs are working within China. Um, there's there's quite a limited social space for for outside influence. Um, and I think it's also difficult because obviously China has quite an authoritarian regime and doesn't have you know kind of the uh, Democracy getting in the way um, of of making very sweeping uh, very sweeping decisions, um, and so I'm not too sure how applicable this kind of um, policy making would be to to other countries. Um, so so I mean it's I think I, I think it's interesting to reflect upon, and I think of course it's interesting from a Western perspective. West I, I find that the kind of Western media often to be very critical of, of Chinese policies and on of the way that China runs its its kind of the country. Um, but I, I think it's it's important for for us as Western observers to to um, to look at the pros as well as the cons of uh, the inadvertent pros as well as the cons of, of government policy. Mm. You, uh, Natasha, you um, said something at the end uh, of the talk about one family having four, five children, four ch girls and a boy. Yes. What can you elaborate on that? Because it's the one child policy, and then I thought you can only have two at the most. Yeah. Well, I mean, their forced abortions are not as common as the Western media presents. Mm -hmm. um, it's you just get fined very heavily. Um, also, if you're working in a in a government position, you would often get fired from that position if you were having if you were having um, too many children. But there are there are a number of, of kind of strange things. I mean, it, the law changes in the different provinces. For example, if if my sister can't and her husband can't have a child, their their right to have a child can be given to me, and so I can have I can have a child almost on their behalf. For example, um, but that that the, also the as I say the one child policy has only come about in um, it was in the nineteen seventy nine and at that time it wasn't very strict, but in the nineteen eighties and nineteen nineties became a lot more strict. So potentially that that family could have had children that were age thirty, um, and and so wasn't as kind of as strict at that time. And by the time those children had grown up, they they had had more children. Something that's interesting in this regard is that there's there's um, very large age gaps between the children that that are kind of born to these families, and that's because maternity leave is so is so small, and often children would be sent from a very young age to live with their grandparents, perhaps you know kind of hundreds of miles away. Um, and so, and so obviously, grandparents aren't really willing to look after a whole family of children at once. So, so if they were going to have multiple children, then then it, they would be very spaced out. So there, there could be a number of reasons why that was the case, or that family could have just had massive fines, um, which some choose to do. Do you know? Um, like people still say, you know, 
some things are worth having another child. Losing your job, paying the fine for that family. To have a son might have been worth it. Okay, a uh, question about um, just in terms of uh, you mentioned how sort of this is they're very competitive and sort of yeah. creating this um, opportunity for the girls to be part of well to be on equal footing to men in a way. Yeah. Uh, but uh, bearing in mind the film that we just saw before your talk, um, I'm thinking about how this effectively then also creates a lot of, what do you say, so-called losers in a way, like not everyone yeah. is able to leave or to go to the West. And in China, there's profound, um, you know, over, there's too many men in a way that get stuck in the countryside because the girls move, in, move to the West or go to the West yeah. to study to work. Um, and uh, also, I mean, in population studies, they talk dependency flows and how um, this new way, like education, leads to a reversal of dependency flows where before children would, um, you know, take care of their parents, which is yeah. what we see here. At the same time, now parents are taking care of their children, so the flows of wealth is sort of shifted from from children being a future investment to children being a burden. Yeah. Um, and how that can be a sort of problematic thing when there are no jobs and there are we are educating like in the end what for because not everyone can go to the west and then you sort of yeah you know, do you know what I, I mean, mean I think I think like for example for the, the the young people that I was working with the idea of going to the west is just not there at the moment uh, the idea of going to the east of China is what they're striving for going to big cities like Shanghai and places like that um, I think that there, there's, um, yeah, I mean, I, I completely agree. Like, something that's interesting is that just because life is so expensive, parents are supporting their children until their children are 30 or 40. And, th and it's only then that the reversal starts, especially in the villages. Uh, the gender inequalities are, I think, being um, increased by this female education. As I said, the, a lot of women are... are aiming a lot higher in terms of, of the kind of men that they can marry, aiming to marry foreigners and not Chinese men at all if they can. Um, I think that, yeah, I mean, this, this greater demand is putting a lot of pressure on, on men um, kind of for different reasons than women. Um, and I, it's just, I, I think, I mean, it's a, it's a crisis waiting to happen. I, I really don't know what's, what is going to happen. I mean, at the moment, the, 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 the men who can't get married are obviously kind of the lowest of the low, no education, and there's large kind of swathes of migrant labor that kind of move around China. But um, the financial crisis is beginning to hit China, and jobs are starting to become um, kind of increasingly hard to get, and, and the students are being warned of this. And so, so is education such a good investment anyway? Um, I would suggest that it still is because, there's st because it's still so closely linked to status. Even if you don't have a job, if you have a degree, you can marry someone with a job. But I think that there's also a lot, there is increasingly, I mean, my, my parents live on the, east coast, of on the uh, east coast of China, and among their students, my parents are both teachers, among their students, there's a lot of um, talk about the communist government and about uh, dissatisfaction with the way things are running. And I think that that is going to increase with an economic, with economic kind of strain, um, and and I kind of wonder like what what's what's going to happen in that situation where, where you have all these people who are so heavily in debt because of education and who can't get jobs and and now. And, that, and the government isn't providing what they want. I mean, you know, a, a, a kind of a dictator is fine when everything, when the economy is fine. But but I would suggest that the, the Chinese government is not as stable as it has been previously. Um, yeah, thanks for all these presentations. I was I was going to ask you something. I said because I as if I really found this uh, this military uh, these military metaphors really interesting, especially because they're obviously drawn from. So it, it almost seems the, the way that you know, not necessarily at the moment military is structured. So I was, I was wondering where they actually drew this from. You suggested that this is partly in, in part from the Civil War, mm. which would interestingly suggest that it's actually they draw it from a local phenomenon rather than sort of from this idea, you know, how do I ever speak about that? And sort of you draw from global media and global transfers and you watch it on the news and you know, so it's not actually from an American action film, but it seems like it's from the local history. And I wonder to what extent 
you know, that's the case, or whether they actually drew on it differently, you know, saying, I'm, I'm like, I'm Rambo or something else. <laughs> no, absolutely. Like, this is one of the points I didn't have time to make, but, you know, I would argue that the sort of cosmopolitan concept as a way of making sense of his culture here is really quite, quite, uh, it's not very helpful. I mean, if you look at the kind of names that people take, um, the <coughs> most popular name among Kulmina Anu was General Kunda. And Kunda is, um, is a rebel. It's a militia in the east of the country. Um, a lot of people took names from generals under the Mobutu regime. Some people also, like the, the guys who lived on my street, took a name from the, the kind of presidential guard of the current president. But absolutely, these are all kind of figures from local politics, recent local history. Um, so yes, while there's, you know, sort of superficial, I mean, you can certainly make a comparison with uh, gang culture in other parts of the world, <coughs> the models are very much local. But that's not to say that it's simply a continuity of, of tradition underneath in, in, in new clothes. But I'd say metaphorically, people uh, use a sort of idea of the hunter and so on. So, so the first, the first question is about the role of, of women in um, the the role of daughters in, in families where there's more than one child or where there's a lot of sons. Yeah, I mean, um, for some families, for example, if you have uh, one um, a, a girl, and perhaps you might pay more for a girl than if you had a boy. So pay more for a girl. In fines. Oh, in fines. In fines. Oh, and um, so for example, in the. <laughs> If you you wouldn't pay more in fines, it, I mean the fine is the same if you have a second child or third child, regardless. But if you're living, I mean as I say, every province is different. But in this province, if you lived in the village, and in China there's a very clear distinction, there's a bureaucratic distinction between those that live in the town, the city, or the village. If you live in the village and you have and your first child is a girl, then you are eligible to have a second child, um, because I guess because of the cultural significance of, of having um, of having a son. But that that isn't. That isn't the case in the towns and the cities where people would consider themselves to be more civilized, <laughs> you know, to, to not make that gender discrimination. Um, in terms of the, um, yeah, as I said, I was working in a, in a kind of a small town, kind of, I mean, basically a village. Um, the, there wasn't, um, it's, it's very difficult because although the data clearly shows that there is a preference for sons, even in the town, um, and that there are, the people will will do anything to, to, to give birth to a son and um, they, they are, they're all very PC when it comes to speaking about gender equality and they always say you know in the past or in the rural areas they think sons are more important but I, I don't think that at all you know I'm, I'm modern and I'm kind of civilized and whatever so I mean it was very it was very difficult to talk about that but certainly the um, the, the sons felt that there was more pressure put on them by their parents to succeed um, in order to kind of in order to support and the the girls the gir the girl the girl's education wasn't as prioritized by their parents. If if the girl gets a good education that's great and we'll provide it but more important that she marries that she marries a, a rich man. Uh, I, I've got two questions. Sorry I don't have a question if you sense it because your presentation was just <laughs> uh, anyway um, one question for uh, Isaac was a, um, or two questions. One was the question that you asked to Natasha, um, I'd like to ask to you. Um, and the second one was, did you, uh, what did the, the, the people you're talking about, I was just wondering what their aspirations or what they would maybe like to do. Mm. Uh, I wondered what that was. And then should I ask the question to Natasha now as well? Oh, okay. oh, shall I do that one first? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, in terms of aspirations, the majority of, of guys I knew told me that if they could have gone back to school, they would leave this. With some exceptions, there were some who said, well, you know, um, there were some who were currently at school, were doing it because their friends were doing it. You know, their friends said that they would, but the majority were doing it because they're in a situation where, um, in, in, in Congo, although, there's, although schools belong to the state, people still have to pay, because although even though they're not meant to, in fact they do. <coughs> 
So most of them were in situations where they had been in school, but their parents couldn't pay anymore, so they, they dropped out. So the aspiration was to, was to be in school and to have a job, um, both of which were impossible for them. So it was, it was a stopgap. But that's not to say it doesn't have other meanings as well as I was exploring. Um, I mean, in terms of policy implication, this is also something that I didn't have time to explore much, but what I'm looking at, um, kind of the fundamental question in looking at a, a discourse like Fenomen Coluna is to ask, is it, is it simply a distraction? Because, I mean, the standard um, sociological reading of media obsession with knife crime, for example, in London, or, or the idea of broken Britain, is that it's, it's ideology. That it, it masks the reality of, of, um, of exploitation <coughs> by, by rendering it in moral terms. Um, and what you know, my overall reading is trying to say is that it's more complicated than that. That yes, this is a very moralised discourse. There is great concern with uh, these youth who get depicted in sort of very feral terms. Um, there's, there's this kind of a historical discourse where what Kaluna are doing gets posed as a complete, complete radical break. Nothing like this ever happened before. Whereas, in fact, if you look, there has been kind of uh, delinquents and gangs in Kinshasa ever since it's been a city. But despite this, as I sort of tried to suggest a little bit, popular discussion about popular obsession with the uh, phenomenon is also a way of, of highlighting the failure of the state to provide for young people. <coughs> failure to provide what people call encadrement, like training. So I'm not, I mean, I'm, I'm not uh, pretending to <laughs> offer a, solu a sort of solution to this problem of youth unemployment. What I'm trying to, <coughs> what I'm trying to do more is suggest that the way, we, the way that social scientists should read popular concern about crime is not necessarily by dismissing it as, as the kind of reactionary masses, but it might point towards um, a different modality of critique, I guess. And, and so the quick question for Natasha was, um, in your write-up, do you take it as a responsibility um, to apply a bit of cultural critique in saying um, that they're living in a false logic um, and therefore, you know, it, it's not just a critique of the state. Um, it is valid in, 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 in your research to apply pressure to your informants to be aware uh, of what you're saying about them in terms of, for example, one out of 1,000 being able to achieve a degree. Sorry, I don't, I don't think I understand the culture. I don't know, there tends to be a thing of like, you cannot criticise uh, like what the people you're doing are studying, but I just, yeah, I was just saying, do you think in your write-up you're going like there's obvious case for like <coughs> criticizing, not criticizing, but pu placing pressure for them to face what you're actually saying, rather than just directing at the government. For for them to be aware of what I'm saying. Sorry. Yeah. For for for, for well, the, the the logic within 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 the, the point that you're making. Yeah. Is is the sorry I'm drawing an education point. No no no. Uh, but one out of one thousand. Yeah. Is a is a false logic. A false dream. Yeah. Um, so the, it's it's not just the government you can criticise. Like they also are under criticism. Yeah. I mean, it's. I mean, the way obviously the 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 one one out of one thousand is for the top universities in Beijing. Um, for like Peking University, Fudan, in Shanghai, for example. And I think I think that the the numbers are uh, the. The, the logic is less false in more local universities, but but it's still very it's still very false. But for example, it, with the school that I was, I mean, it, it's it's stratified as you go. For example, so the school where I was uh, working, most students would would expect to get in. This was the top school, one of the top schools in the province. Um, as as you, there was a lot of pressure to get into this school. Um, I don't. I don't know. I mean, I think because having a degree in China is becoming so important if you don't want to remain in the town or the village that you're living in. I think it's worth a shot. Um, I think it's the criticisms of the education system, which is so, uh, which places so much pressure on people. 
And that is really, it's really difficult to criticize China in that regard because obviously it's a nation in transition. You know, it's, it's, it's no, developed. I meant the people, the, the actual people that you talk to. Do you think I should criticize, or place, criticize place, their logic? I, for, I, for I, I, I would say, well, it's not criticized, but, but, but point, place pressure in pointing that out. People are aware of these things, but just um, from my own thing, people will rhetorically say stuff which they do not themselves. Could we move on so you don't know All right, sorry. Um, sorry. Alex, and then move you, and then, yeah, can you make a bit quick to so a little bit behind Firstly, uh, I was really interested by all three of your, your studies. It really highlights some interesting things that I didn't know before, so cheers. Uh, Saskia, I'd like to speak to you about uh, you, your use of filming as an ethnographic tool. And you said you already encountered some issues in the marketplace. And for me, I find it quite striking, maybe even brave, that you actually did that in the first place, of just going in with a camera. Um, and as we all know, cameras create this weird boundary and lens issue. Uh, so in my eyes, using a camera in an ethnographic, as an ethnographic uh, tool, kind of just furthers that divide and boundary further. And I just thought, oh, actually, obviously I, like, I understand the use of film in presenting as documentary style or something, but do you think it has a place as a legitimate tool in recording ethnographic <coughs> material? Um, well, I think it's exactly the issue. Yeah. And it really depends on the context of where you're filming. And it, it generally, the camera would reinforce a boundary, that's clear. Mm -hmm. More so in a context like the market, which is a public place where you don't have a relationship between the people you're filming and yourself. In a context where you are closer with the people, like in the NGO, where people know you, where you go in um, with other locals, where you're introduced, um, and so people are not worried about who you are, it's much easier. Um, obviously here, I think it was more of a presentation tool. Um, mm -hmm. I think as an ethnographic method, it is far more difficult, because what you essentially have to do is become invisible. That means you spend hours and hours um, on, on filming, so you'll have incredible amounts of footage, and then you'll use that. Um, I did do that in other scenarios of things that I haven't shown. Um, the problem with that is um, it's not as concise, because <coughs> you're just filming daily life. So people, I was filming um, um, a baby shower where a new uh, baby was born, so they had invited a lot of women and um, I was just there, and they forgot that I was there. It didn't matter anymore. Um, so I do think it can be used at, a, at that level. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Hi, um, so can you pick up, like, I know you, you probably weren't specifically studying it, but can you pick up the local perception of the Kulana? Yeah, absolutely. Um, again, it was something that I chose not to focus on there. But um, no, that's really the that's really the big question. Is that's really what's more interesting, the question of, of of why people get so excited and hyped up about a particular phenomenon out of many that you could get you could get interested in. It. And I'd say what's interesting is it's a kind of it's almost a sort of a two-faced representation of of Kulin that you get in popular discourse. You know, on the one hand, and you got it a little bit in those two cartoons. There was one where you've got two enormously muscular guys cutting off someone's hands in a very brutal manner. And the other one, you had a skinny boy on the floor being kind of clearly unfairly imprisoned. And it's interesting how popular discourse can switch back and forth between the two. People can be talking about how, oh, in my day, they would have never done this. No one would have ever dreamt of using a machete to, to cut another human. It was just for cutting the roof. Um, and, and talking about these young men as they must be witches, because what they're doing is so antisocial and cruel that it could only be something that a witch does, and maybe even speculating that the way that they hid their machetes at night was, was because they actually their hands might be able to you know, magically turn into machete blade. So it, it could switch between pretty strong accusations of, of evil, really, to a almost materialist kind of an analysis where you're saying, yeah, but how can we really blame these boys when there's no work, there's no opportunities? Um, the state's not looking after them. You know, these are our own children. We know they're not really bad, but they're forced to do this. <coughs> so, um, <coughs> you know, it's, it's, it's not clear. And I think what that hints at is that, um, you know, again, 
popular concern about crime and criminality shouldn't be reduced to um, an ideology that serves, serves the interests of state, this kind of critical criminology is sometimes focused on. It can contain resources. Okay. I think we're going to stop down just because we're really running over. Okay, there was a, one of the talks that's missing from the next section, so it doesn't really matter. I don't know. Um, do you guys, because uh, it'll probably match.